And now, we usually be dealing with wireless mics, but the wireless mics in this room have become a little bit science fiction-y. So we're going wired and old school. <laughs> it's uh, a great pleasure to bring up a documentarian who spent years making this movie. King Cone is so fantastic. Please give it up for Steve Mitchell. Hi. Thank you so much for coming. I'm just thrilled I didn't trip. I'm so clumsy. Uh, I don't know how I follow Larry or Michael, so I'll keep it short, but this is a weekend of firsts. First time I've been to Montreal, fantastic city. First film festival, pretty damn cool. My first documentary feature, and you know, none of this would have happened if Larry Cohen didn't take my phone call. I called him up, I had this idea for the documentary, but I figured if I can't get Larry on board, I really can't do a documentary. So I call Larry up, he says, come on over to the house. He made me a cup of coffee, gave me some cookies. I told him what I told him, the idea. He said, fine, I'll get it financed, I'll cooperate. We got it financed, and he cooperated. <laughs> and now you're gonna see what happened. Thank you. <laughs> and Steve Mitchell, Larry Cohn, Michael Moriarty will be on stage for a Q&A after the screening. And now, enjoy the world premiere of King Cone. Larry, you know, who's the king for movies. Larry is the best gorilla filmmaker in the business. Let's face it, anybody will put up with anything if they think a movie is being shot. Please give it up once more for Steve Mitchell, Michael Moriarty, and the fearless, the law-breaking, the genuinely, brilliantly good man, Larry Cohn! <laughs> now, if everyone were to actually give you $10,000 a piece and you were able to make a film in the next two months or so, yeah. what social ill would you tackle today in 2017? There's too many to think about. I know. But, uh, you know, I'd probably do something political since the... For change? Well, this, well, Jay Hoover was a very political picture, and it was way ahead of its time. If you look at the picture and talk about what's going on with the FBI today and all the controversy about the president and the FBI and all that stuff, you, you'd get a lot of uh, new insights into that from looking at that Jay Hoover movie, which I'm very proud of. <coughs> and today there's a lot of things I could do in politics. So uh, I... Uh, you know, uh, the money comes from the oddest places. All of a sudden, the door opens and somebody shows up and finances your picture. And maybe this documentary will get people excited. Somebody will get, uh, you know, in the mood to finance a Larry Cohen movie. And I'll be out there doing just as crazy things as I did before. Of course, I, 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 I know I couldn't do the stuff in New York City that I did before. You can steal shots in Montreal. Yeah. Our, our police don't care at all. I hope so. <laughs> I certainly hope so. You know that scene where Fred Williamson gets shot in the street that we stole? That's right in front of Trump Tower. That's exactly, we only get five or six years in jail for doing that. So uh, if you compound all the things I did, I'd probably just be getting out of prison the next week. And uh, I'd be the convict director. I don't yes. think there hasn't been a, a convict director yet, has there? A director who directs his movies from behind prison walls? You're not like that, no. Jesus, that's my next picture. <laughs> I, I keep coming up with ideas. All right, what else? You, anybody else want to ask me a question? You want to ask Larry, ask? Michael? <coughs> no. People We're going out to the... Well, first of all, how did it feel for you to, to watch this tonight? I mean, after... I mean, so many of your friends are in this movie. Well, you know, what's, what's weird about it, and I hear this from a lot of filmmakers, you only sort of see the things that bother you. Sure. So there were a couple of little things. But it was great to see it with the, with the crowd, and I'm glad you enjoyed it. It was a lot of fun. Yeah, really and it was fun to see it big on the screen. Yeah. Michael, would, yes. would you come out of retirement if Larry made another film? Pardon? Would you come out of retirement if Larry made another film? No. <laughs> Please. <laughs> no, I, 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 he put you up to this. No, I, I, um, I'm retired, and I'm after 50 years in the entertainment business. I'm composing. 
operas. I have not, I'm composing nine operas, and that's all I want to do. And when that's done, I've done what I really wanted to do all my life. Michael, I, I hate to tell you, but remember that autograph you signed at dinner tonight? Yes. That was that was a ah, contract. Contract. <laughs> I got you for twelve weeks. Right, there you go. Call my lawyer. Yes, Call my uh, lawyer. You're stuck, kid. <laughs> One of my favorites of your 70s uh, repertoire cast, James Dixon. Can you tell us a bit about your friendship with him and your history with him? Yeah, it's such a pleasure to see him show up anywhere. Yeah, J Jimmy Dixon's in the picture. He's been in most of my movies. Mm -hmm. We were in the Army together. We were best friends in the Army. And uh, when, when we both got out of the Army, we, we maintained our friendship. And uh, when I started making pictures like Black Caesar, Jimmy came down and dressed up like a police officer. Of course, he kind of looks like a cop. <laughs> and he's closed down streets and stopped traffic and, and he... So you him actually impersonating a cop, like, for real, in New York. Yeah, he, he, he's the one who closed down Fifth Avenue when we were shooting that scene. And he was very active in the St. Patrick's Day Parade sequence. And he's done a lot of things in all of my movies. He's been in every one of the It's Alive movies. So, uh, you know, I always like having him around because he's somebody I can trust and who's really a good friend and has remained so over the years. And uh, so, what can I say? God bless Jimmy Dixon. I wish he was here with us tonight. Same here. And uh, can you talk about your experience working with Zoe Tamerlis Lund? Zoe Tamerlis uh, had been in a movie called MS-45, which Abel Ferrara made. And it was a very good movie, and she was excellent in it. She had a great screen presence. And then nothing happened to her after that, really. And so, uh, when I was looking for a new face to put into this movie to play these two parts, uh, she plays two different people. And uh, I, I, I interviewed a few actresses, but then Zoe came in and I immediately gave her the part. She was a very odd girl because she wouldn't tell anybody where she lived uh, and she wouldn't give anybody her phone number. And the production people came to me and said, what are we going to do with this girl? She won't tell us where she lives. We, we can't give her a call in the mornings. I, I, I said, well, has she ever been late? And they said, no. I said, well, then leave her alone. <laughs> they, they, they weren't satisfied. Just out of their own curiosity, they tried to follow her home one night, but she changed taxi cabs and eluded them. So, <laughs> so I said, leave her be. And Zoe had this satchel she always carried. Where, and when she worked on the set, she always brought the thing with her, wherever she moved to on the set. And I said, well, what's in there? She says, that's my screenplay that I wrote. And I said, well, 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 why don't you leave it at home? She said, someone might break in and steal it. I said, but don't you have any other copies? She said, oh, no, I couldn't have it copied because the copy place might make a copy for themselves and steal it. She was obsessed that someone's going to steal this script. So, OK, Zoe, carry it with you wherever you go. Well, the script was The Bad Lieutenant which was later made by Abel Ferrara, and was a famous film, and uh, then later remade years later. So that's what she was carrying around on the set all the time. She was the screenwriter of that particular picture. Very brilliant girl. Unfortunately, uh, as so many at that period of time, she got into drugs, and uh, she moved to France and uh, died there of a drug overdose. Very young. So uh, it's, it's a terrible loss because I thought she had a great screen look, a great screen presence, and she could really act. And, incredible. And she, was a, and she was a very nice person, too. What can you say? So many of the people in my films have passed away. When we were, had a screening recently in New York of God Told Me To, Tony Lobianco came and uh, made an appearance. Everybody else in the cast is dead. So, I mean, even the young people, they all died. Everybody died. So. And so many of these films, uh, John Ryan, the star of uh, the It's Alive movie, uh, he passed away. Uh, they're all gone, so well, I have nice memories of these people, but uh, unfortunately, everybody in the J. Edgar Hoover movie, except for maybe Rip Torn, uh, ha is dead now. Uh, Michael Parks, who played Bobby Kennedy, died a couple of weeks ago. So what are you gonna say? You just go on and make your movies, and you have your, your nice memories of people. I'd like to keep in touch with people, and someday 
I might be able to find Michael Moriarty and make friends with him again. <laughs> if, 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 you know, he might be forgiving me for the pet. Not a chance, huh? <laughs> Not a chance. All right, what else? Anybody else? Well, let's sit, okay, should we open up some questions from the audience? There's a lot of uh, uh, discussion of that in the film. He's accused of uh, T. and Tulsa of being homosexuals, and uh, but there's no proof of it and no evidence of it. And frankly, I mean, there's a lot of erroneous information. I mean, they did not live together at all. We filmed in Tolson's apartment, and he's about 25 minutes away from Hoover's house. We filmed in Hoover's house, and I checked out Hoover's house at that time. All his clothes and everything was still uh, in the closet. Everything was still there. The place had been donated to charity, but had not been emptied. So it was really the home of an old man. I mean, if you looked at, uh, uh, at the chair, if you took the doily off the back of the chair, the leather chair was cracked and it was covered up with a doily. Everything was old and nothing had been fixed up. It had none of the sensibilities that you'd see in, in the home of gay people who usually have good taste and, and, and some sense of style and some sense of, some sense of you know, it, it, was, it was nothing but your grandfather's old house. Uh, I think that those two guys were what used to be called bachelors. And uh, they, they, you know, they, they, that was what they were called, lace curtain bachelors. Guys, all they were interested in doing is watching the ball game and playing cards and that was it. I don't think sex ever came up between Tolson and, and Hoover, unlike the Clint Eastwood version of the movie, which was all a gay-oriented movie, uh, and uh, it was totally incorrect. So I just, I just don't think that even was the case. But uh, I, I, I brought it up in the movie because so many people over the years had accused them of that, but nobody ever had any backup. Oh, Sam Fuller, uh, the house that I live in and have owned for years that you saw in the movie was formerly owned by Sam Fuller. Uh, back in the days when he made steel helmet stuff, made a good, he made a lot of money at one time, and he had a beautiful house. The house was built by the Hearst family in 1929. It was the home of George Hearst, William Randolph Hearst's son, and it was designed by uh, the same architect who designed the San Simeon Castle. So uh, Sam Fuller bought the house. Later on, he lost it in a divorce. And then when I found out from an actor named John Ireland who came up to talk to me about a part, and he said he'd been to the house before when Sam Fuller lived there. So it was the first time I knew about Sam Fuller's occupancy. And then I ran into Sam Fuller at a party at the Beverly Hills Hotel, and I introduced myself and told him I owned the house. And he asked me if he could bring his current wife up to see it. And uh, they did, and we became very good friends, and we started seeing them socially, and then when we went to Paris, where he was living, we spent a lot of time with him in Paris, and so I became good friends with him. And I loved hearing his anecdotes and hanging out, and then I decided, hey, why don't I write a part for him in a movie? And as it turned out, I didn't know it at the time, but he was in need of money because he had, a, he had a, a daughter who was sick and needed a lot of medical care. And so I called him up and I said, Samuel, I, I'm writing you a part in a movie. And I sent him the script. As it says in the film, he complained about how, much li how many lines he had. I said, well, Sam, all you did before was walk-ons in Wim Wenders movies and other people. They never gave you anything to do. I'm giving you a big part. You're, you're playing the Edward G. Robinson part. So, Anyway, you know, it was, the part was really patterned after Edward G. Robinson's part in The Stranger with Orson Welles, where this uh, grizzly old guy comes to this New England town looking for Nazis. And uh, you might have seen the picture. So anyway, it, this was a similar part. So he, he came over and he did the part for me, and uh, he, we had a great time together. So I, I, I saw him quite often, even later on after he had a stroke, the last time I saw him was at the Raleigh Studios. He was kind of holding court with all the people 
from his movies like Robert Stack and Angie Dickinson and people. They all came over to see him. He'd had this stroke and he couldn't really speak leg uh, coherently. But he didn't shut up for a minute. He just kept talking gibberish. He'd sit there and talk and nobody could understand two words he was saying. And they'd all sit around him at his feet and nod their heads and smile and pretend they could understand him. And it was kind of sad but lovely. And then I give him a hug and it's the last time I saw him. But uh, I treasured the time I spent with him. He was, he was a great guy. Uh, yes. No, I thought we made a terrific movie and, and it's always a good idea to quit while you're ahead. But I did do a bunch of movies with Moriarty afterwards, but he played a different kind of character in each one. I didn't want to go back and do the exact same thing all over again. It's been brought up, but uh, I, I tell you the truth, if somebody walked in and said, we want to do another movie about Jimmy Quinn, I'd have to look over, I'd have to look over at Moriarty. <laughs> He'd hit me with his cane and that would be the end of it. like people to see the Hoover movie again and I'd like him to see best uh, special effects and Perfect Strangers. Perfect Strangers is a very unusual movie since the leading character is a two-year-old child who has not learned to speak so I had to direct a child who does not have the capacity to speak and uh, in a very intricate and large role in this movie and uh, that, uh, that was a real fun challenge. I mean, everybody thought I was crazy. How are you going to direct a kid who can't talk? Uh, but I would sit the kid down and tell him what the scene was about, and then he would go and do it. <laughs> what can I tell you? What can I tell you? I mean, it was truly amazing. Uh, I try to find that guy now. He must be 30-some 30, 30 years old and find out if he remembers ever making the picture, but I couldn't, I couldn't locate him. So, Question from Michael. What is your most outlandish or cherished memory of working with Larry? Um, oh my gosh, there's so many of them. Uh, um, oh, I, I, I think the wonderfully outlandish thing about Larry is that of all the people in Hollywood I've worked with, and that's a lot of biggies, um, the only man that I respect and really fell in love with because of his goodness was Larry Cohen. So, um, and he's up against some great competition, but he wins the prize because he's a good man. Who's gonna do Trump? Make a Trump movie, a Trump movie. Oh, well, you know, the ch strange coincidence is that some 20 years ago or more, I was hired by TNT, the network, to write uh, the Donald Trump story. That's when he was a big real estate tycoon in New York and he wasn't in politics. And I, I got the assignment and I took it and I wrote the script. And part of the deal was I went to Las Vegas to meet with Donald Trump to discuss the TV movie. It was gonna be a movie of the week. And uh, so the producer and me end up at Caesar's Palace in Vegas. And he looks at me, the producer, and he says, now what do we do? And I say, what do you mean? Don't you have a contact? Don't you have somebody you're supposed to meet here who's going to take us to Donald Trump? He says, I don't know. Typical <laughs> producer. So finally, I walked over to the house phone in the lobby of the Caesar's Palace. I picked up the phone. I said, Donald Trump, please. A moment later, a voice says, yes. I said, Donald Trump, he says, speaking. I says, we're here, to, we're here to talk about the TV movie. Oh, come into the back of the casino. There's a double door. Wait there, I'll send somebody to get you. They brought us back. There he was in his shirt sleeves. He was very friendly. He was much younger. His hair was different, of course. And, and we sat around for two and a half hours chatting about the TV movie. And then about an hour and a half into it, he suddenly turned to the patio door, which was open, and he said, M, get in here. And in sauntered instantly, Marla Maples, wearing a, a bikini bathing suit, very tan, with three-inch heels, looking fabulous. And she served us 
drinks and hors d'oeuvres. And then she went out again. And then we had the rest of the meeting. And, and then he said, would you like to come to a party tonight? I said, can I bring my wife? Yes. And we went to the party that night and he was very friendly. And that was on a Saturday. Sunday was the National Book Show. That's what he was there for, to promote a new book. So we got up in the morning, went over to the uh, convention hall, and there was the New York Times people were looking at. Front page, banks foreclose on Donald Trump. The next day, after the meeting, I couldn't believe it. Now he's in trouble with the banks. Uh, Monday we get back to Los Angeles, TNT cancels the project. I got paid in full. <laughs> I've still got the script. And as, last time I saw Donald Trump was up in, up in uh, Bel Air at a party. And uh, he was there, I was there, uh, a bunch of heavyweights were there. It was, a, it was a party honoring the woman who played the queen in the movie The Queen, uh, Helen Mirren. And he was there. And uh, he said to me, hello, how are you? And I said, fine, how are you? And that was it. I never brought up the fact that I'd ever worked with him before or written something for him before. And I don't know if he, he never saw the script and nobody saw the script and I've got the script. So for those of you who contribute $10,000, so <laughs> that script will be available to you. Any more questions? Yeah. Right there. Oh yeah, right, right. Yes. Well, I don't, I'm not into doing sequels to my own movies. I think when I've made the movie, I've made it and I can make another picture. In the same amount of time, with the same amount of money, I'd rather make something new rather than make something over again. I did do sequels to It's Alive. I did a couple of them. I tried to make each one as different as possible. But I don't want to do another stuff. And as far as Maniac Cop goes, I just assume not talk about those movies. Frankly, I, I wrote them, but I wasn't crazy about them, frankly. So they weren't my pictures. And uh, I don't want to say anything negative about anybody else's work. But uh, that, uh, and that's the end of that question. Anybody, <laughs> anybody else got a question? Yes, sir. Well, I'm glad that these pictures got made, and I'm glad somebody bought them, too. Uh, and uh, as far as phone booth goes, I mean, I think that uh, uh, they did a decent job with it. Uh, at first, when I saw it, I didn't like it. But I got to like it better as I saw it more often. And I thought that the, uh, the addition of Seaforth Sutherland really helped the picture tremendously. And, uh, and Colin Farrell was good in the picture. Uh, I'll tell you. I thought he cried too much. And uh, when, the, when I saw the picture, the best place to find out how, what a picture's doing is to go on 42nd Street to a theater in, in mid-Manhattan where most of the audience is black. And they'll tell you what they don't like. They speak right out during the movie and they tell you what they think. And if they don't like it, they, they, talk, they talk. And they didn't like him crying. They, they, they didn't like him crying at all. That was not manly to them. And uh, th I think that hurt the picture to some degree. Uh, I remember when we did uh, a bestseller. Bestseller was, was playing very well in the theater uh, with this black audience until the last five minutes of the picture. And there's this little girl who's Brian Dennehy's daughter. And uh, the bad guy's down at the foot of the stairs shooting at them. And for some reason, this little girl goes running down the stairs in the direction of the man who's shooting, right into her arms. And the audience, they start yelling at the screen, stupid little bitch, kill that bitch, kill that stupid little bitch. And I said, yeah, I said here goes the whole fucking movie. <laughs> I mean, we're all, it's almost over. We're almost to the finishing line and they had to make this stupid mistake and I told them not to do that. I told them when I saw the cut of the picture, cut out the shots of the guy at the bottom of the stairs shooting. The girl can run down the stairs and the bad guy suddenly pops up from nowhere and grabs her. But if she's already down there shooting, why would anybody run down the stairs? Well, they wouldn't listen to me. 
you know, they never want to listen to you. So they did it their way. That was, they, it really ruined the picture, frankly. And, uh, you know, uh, if I had directed Phone Booth, I would have shot it in New York City rather than in a simulated New York street in downtown LA. I would have had buses and cabs and tremendous congestion and, you know, hundreds of people going by. Well, I would have probably stolen a lot of it, see? And, and you know, it would have been a much more congested environment, and, uh, and I could have made the picture more exciting, I think. But for what he did, you know, Schumacher shot that picture in 11 days. I mean, I could, even I have never shot a movie in 11 days, but he shot the picture in 11 days by having four or five crews going in, all the actors there, and covering it like it was an actual event so that all the actors were working at the same time and reacting at the same time as if it was really happening. So he managed to polish the picture off quickly. I, I wouldn't have done it that way. But anyway, I, did, I didn't denounce the picture. I got, ex I got used to it, let's say. You know, I got used to it. With uh, uh, Cellular, uh, actually I like the Chinese version better. Warner Brothers China made the picture all over again with a Chinese cast, and it was very well done. It was called The Call. And uh, actually, I thought it was better than the American version. But, you know, I, <coughs> I can't tell you that I'm always satisfied with what other people do to the pictures. And usually, when you try and talk to people, they don't want to hear anything you have to say. So that's, that's the problem, basically, is pe people are so afraid of criticism that when you, make, when you, when you try and help them in some way, uh, they, they can't accept it. They think you're trying to overwhelm them and take over their picture or something. Well, maybe because I've directed so many films and have a reputation for that, they think I'm kind of going there and tell them what to do with their movie. But usually I'm not. I'm just trying to be helpful. But that's the way it operates. You all know, having made movies, what it's like. Oh, so many hands. Uh, yeah, Jill. Yeah, well, th there's also a lot of the TV stuff we couldn't we couldn't talk about as well. I mean, the guy's got a career that's you know like single space, like that high. You know, we couldn't do everything. <laughs> He's worn out. Yeah. Boy, that's a good question. Uh, you know, I I kind of let the material guide me. You know, we didn't have a script. Uh, we did hours and hours and hours of interviews with him plus everybody else and I just sort of the material ultimately sort of steered me it was kind of making a documentary is very zen and there were two or three times when my editor and I we felt we were completely out to sea I mean I literally I turned to my editor who I think did a great job his name is Kai Thomasian and and I said what the hell are we doing you know where are we I mean I felt like I was in the middle of the Pacific in a raft but you just have to trust the material and trust Larry, and we trusted Larry's character. You know, and that was our guidepost. As far as being a writer uh, and, and having that influence me, if, if it did, I, I didn't know it at the time. Did I, get, did I thank all these people, Steve Mitchell? That yeah, I did yeah that you, you, oh, yeah. you thank those guys. I especially want to thank my, my producing partners, Matt Verboys and Dan McKeon, for taking a leap of faith on this project. Yeah. The founders of La La Land Records, incidentally. You know, I, I had this idea, uh, oh, quick anecdote. I had lunch with Matt one day. Matt is the co-owner of La La Land Records, a great soundtrack label. And Matt's a big, big movie fan. And I had this idea, I said, you know, maybe Matt might want to finance this picture. As Larry says, it's all about financing. So I call Matt up and I say, I have this idea, you want to do something maybe a little different. He says, I don't know, but let's have lunch. I literally finish lunch, I turn to him, I say, I want to do a documentary about Larry Cohen. He says, I'm already interested. And by the time we were officially done with lunch, he said, I don't know how we're going to do it, but we're going to do it. And we're here a couple of years later because of him and my partner Dan for getting it done. Couldn't have done it without him. Great guys. Thank you, guys. I 
never got in any real trouble, if, as, as you might call, mean, pol trouble with the studio or trouble with the police. Or tr there was no trouble with anything. I had trouble with some, some actors, usually, the first day. There was a number of actors that I had trouble with the first day. I usually fired them, and they came back uh, an hour later and apologized and never bothered me again for the whole rest of the picture. Eric, Eric Roberts and I had a big fight the first day, and uh, I, I told him he was right in the argument, and he wouldn't listen. I kept saying, but Eric, I'm agreeing with you. I'm right. Oh, fuck you. And all that. <laughs> so, and then I said, well, Eric, in that case, I guess neither one of us is going to leave this project. So. Um, yeah, okay, fuck you, and he walks out, and I'm sitting there, a few minutes later, door opens, come back in, okay, I just want to make the picture, let's make the picture, never had an, a, another bad word out of him, every morning, good morning, boss, what do you want me to do today, end of every day, came over, give me a kiss on the cheek, thanks for a wonderful day, never a bit of trouble, so I don't know, yeah, I've had that with a number of different actors, where the first day, they got to feel themselves out, and see if they can cause you any trouble, and if you're going to take it or not. So I, uh, I, I, I never take it. I just I fire them immediately, and they always come back. Listen, listen here now. You're acting silly. You're asking, you're asking me to make a fool of myself out here, and I'm not doing it just to get you to do a part. You signed the contracts even if you didn't know it, and now you have to be in the picture. That's all, that's all there is to it. I'm not, not going to fool around with you. No, I actually... <laughs> you know, I actually, I actually played the part of it when in a pilot the 20th Century Fox made called You're Only Young Twice, starring Ethel Waters, the great black singer, and Edwin. And in the pilot, he creates a youth pill that makes older people young again. So in the pilot, he takes the pill himself, and guess who he turns into? Me. <laughs> so so I would, a producer came to my house for dinner, and he said he was doing a pilot with Ed Wynn. And I that went right into the routine. And he says to me, oh my god, we've been looking all over for somebody to play young Ed Wynn. Would you come out to the studio? and do this for Bill Dozier, the producer. He was the producer also of Batman. So I went out to the studio, and I did it for Bill Dozier. He says, that's great. You have to go down to the stage now and do it for Ed Wynn. I said, I got to go down and do Ed Wynn for Ed Wynn. So I, went, so I went down there, and there he was, cute as hell. And I did it for him. And he says to me, oh, no, you got it all wrong. Yeah. He said, you're doing the perfect fool. You know, I don't do that anymore. I'm a dramatic actor now. I said, I said you don't talk like that now? He said, I, I certainly don't. Don't you see? I'm different now than I used to be. I said, I'm sorry. I'll try to change. <laughs> <laughs> It, it, it was a classic. Then when the film was finished, the 30-minute pilot, and they had a screening of it at 20th Century Fox, and people came out, and they talked to me, and they were under the impression that Edwin had dubbed me. That actually it wasn't me at all, that I was just moving my mouth, and Edwin's voice was on there, and then he had dubbed me, and he hadn't dubbed me, it was all me. But what are you gonna do? You know, you can't win. So. And Edwin and I became very good friends, and we, uh, we spent a lot of time together, and I enjoyed that relationship. He, he'd been a great star, at, in, at, uh, not only in, uh, on radio, and even before radio, on Broadway. I mean, Edwin was such a big star, I think he was the only star ever to star in two Broadway shows at the same time. The theaters were next door to each other, and it was timed out so he could do the scenes in one show, <laughs> cross the alley and do scenes in the other show and play in two shows at the same time on Broadway. I don't think anybody's, that's how big a star he was at one time. So, so there. <laughs> yeah, uh, thanks Thank you very you much. Thank you so much, man. I think I can't top that. Let's get home. I love you. All Larry right. Cohn, Steve Mitchell, Michael Moriarty. <laughs>